In 2005, on a weekend day, as I was driving to work, there was a fun run in progress. I noticed there was an ambulance and a commotion. Being a doctor, in fact I'm a cardiologist, I thought I'd stop and see if I could offer assistance. It turns out a man, one of the participants of the fun run, had dropped dead from a heart attack and was by the roadside. There was another doctor and a nurse who were participants of the fun run. They'd also stopped to give assistance. And with the two ambulance officers, we worked on this man. We got his heart beating again. We got him in the back of the ambulance into the local hospital where he received a life-saving stent to the artery down the front of his heart. His story was so good, in fact, that it made the front page of the local newspaper just a couple of days later. Now, you can't see it clearly, but there is a reference there to the cardiologist who offered assistance. <laughs> now, modesty prevents one from indulging too much, but opportunities like this rarely come up, so I bought a copy of the paper and took it to work. <laughs> and it only took a moment for one of my secretaries to point out I'd seen the very same man some 18 months earlier as a patient. Well, what I want to tell you is that I burst out laughing, slapped my leg and said, wow, what a coincidence. Because everything I've read about TED Talks tells me there should be humour. <laughs> but that's not true. Actually, I didn't laugh. I didn't laugh at all. I was immediately struck by the gravity of the situation. I had not seen that event coming. I was shocked. I went back and looked at my notes to see what had happened and it turned out I'd done everything right for this man according to local and international guidelines. I'd put him through a treadmill test and he'd pass with flying <coughs> colours. I'd put him through a risk calculator and found that his risk was low. In fact, he got a green thermometer and I reassured him and sent him on his merry way, only to be standing over his dead body some 18 months later. Clearly something is wrong here. And what I'd like to do for the remainder of my talk is share with you how my assessment in 2003 just didn't provide what this man needed and how we can do better. Well, let's start with stress testing. The premise is really straightforward. If we take a piece of artery that goes to a piece of heart muscle, blood goes down that artery. If we restrict that blood flow for some reason, the muscle doesn't get enough blood, it's under stress and strain, and we pick that up on the dots that we monitor people with, so straightforward. When we think about what goes on in arteries, plaque can build up in arteries, and when it's early on, plaque doesn't limit flow at all, so the blood goes down freely, no restriction. These people would be completely asymptomatic, so they can work hard, blood flows down, no symptom. But as plaque progresses, it can get to a point where it's flow limiting. And these people, when they increase the workload of the heart, need more blood, not enough blood gets there, they may get chest pain and shortness of breath. We also pick that up on our ECG, on our stress test. If we stop to look at what that plaque is made up of, both in non-flow limiting and flow limiting plaque, it turns out they're actually cut from the same cloth, no surprise. And the concept is a bunch of cholesterol sitting in the artery wall covered by a fibrous cap that separates that from the contents of the blood. So when a heart attack occurs, that fibrous cap is disrupted for some reason, and that allows mixing of the contents of the lumen with the cholesterol plaque, and that's not meant to happen and a clot forms. That clot can form suddenly and block the artery completely, and you have a heart attack. Well, the interesting thing about all this is when we look in more detail at heart attacks, it turns out about 60% of all heart attacks occur on flow limiting plaque. These are people who would have had some clue beforehand, maybe shortness of breath or chest pain on exertion. But here's the scary thing. 40% of all heart attacks occur on plaque that is non-flow limiting up until the moment that the plaque ruptures. Think of our fun runner. He put his sand shoes on that morning expecting to run 10 kilometres because he felt fine. So now that we understand heart attack, because we're all, we've just gone through second year medicine and we're <laughs> right across it, 
what we're going to do is think about how good our stress test is for predicting heart attack. So let's start with our patients who have got narrowed arteries, they're flow limiting. Uh, they've got flow limiting plaque and they should be symptomatic. So we put them on a treadmill test. It turns out the treadmill tests are not perfect tests, that we have very few perfect tests. Our treadmill test will pick up about 85% of what's actually there. Does that make sense? So if we pick up 85% of the 60% of heart attacks, someone can do the maths to check me, but it's 51%. Now we could toss a coin and get a 50% pickup rate. Are we impressed with stress testing for predicting heart attack? I don't think so. Okay, well let's look at our asymptomatic patients, our people who have non-flow limiting plaque. We put them through a treadmill test, there's no limitation to flow. How many heart attacks could we potentially pick up or predict? Zero, correct. So what I really want to get across to you guys is that narrowed arteries don't kill you. Arteries that suddenly block do. So when we think about our stress test, it's good for correlating symptoms of chest pain and shortness of breath with strain on the heart. So it's a diagnostic tool, it's good for that. It's good for telling us if you're fit. So lots of patients want to know how far they went. Is that good compared to the guy you just had through? But it's not very good for telling us the health of the arteries and it's just no good for predicting heart attack. Let's look at risk calculators. This is a standard sort of risk calculator. When I saw the fun runner back in 2003, I said something like, well, given your male 50 something, blood pressure's well controlled on blood pressure tablets, et cetera, et cetera, cholesterol's okay, non-smoker, your risk of a heart attack is only 6% in the next five years, you'll be fine. But I misrepresented that data and what I should have said to this man is fun runner, based on your characteristics, what this risk calculator is telling me is if I take 100 men with the same characteristics and follow those 100 men for five years, six of them will have a heart attack or stroke. I just don't know if you're one of the six or one of the 94. Because back in 2003, I really didn't have a good grasp of the difference between population-based probability, which is the rate of event in the population, which is given to us by the risk calculator, versus individual actuality, because the individual is either going to have an event, 100%, think fun runner, or not have a, an event, 0%. Let me introduce you to the 50 year old male 100 voice choir, and I'm embarrassed to say that the choir master here has a better handle on this concept than I did back in 2003. And he says, okay guys, I've spoken to the doc, and he says about, Six of you will have a heart attack in the next five years. Could I just ask that it's not all the tenors? <laughs> but what if we could be more precise? What if we could take our 50 year old male 100 voice choir and do something, put them through a scan or a screen or figure out who in that group is actually at high risk? Well, it turns out that plaque leaves a footprint in the artery it leaves calcium. So where cholesterol's building up in arteries, we see the footprint of the tiger. And as fate would have it, we have a machine that allows us to scan for that calcium. It's a CT scanner. And it means that we can then look at people's individual hearts. We can look inside. On the left hand side, a healthy looking heart. On the right hand side, clearly a problem. Once we've got this information, we can start to really break down our 100 voice choir into the true high risk people, the true low risk people, and those in between. And why is that important? Because if we can find the truly high risk people before they have a heart attack, we can put in place treatment that can actually prevent the heart attack. Anyone think that's a good idea? <laughs> yeah, me too. So, the reason I'm up here is that even though this technology is broadly available, it's broadly underutilised. And many, many of my colleagues still are happy to treadmill test and put people through risk calculators to evaluate their risk of a heart attack. And that's in spite 
of heart disease being the number one killer of men and women in the Western world. Accounting for over 9 million people globally. In America, 640,000 people per annum, that's one in every four deaths. And since I started talking, 10 to 15 people have had a heart attack. No one in this room, I'm pleased to say. <laughs> but the statistic that is most staggering for me is this one. Two in 10 of those heart attacks 20% are occurring in people 65 years of age or under. These are not people ready to die. These are people who still have plenty of life to live, plenty of life to give. I can think of no one better to offer some comments at this stage. Hi, my name is Gary. In 2005, during the City to Casino fun run, I had a heart attack. Remarkably, I was resuscitated and survived. My three children were almost orphaned that day. I had no idea before the event that I was at high risk. Fortunately, I'm still alive, but I know others who are really so lucky. There was no way to predict what happened to me, but times have changed. Do you know your real risk of heart attack? So most remarkably, Gary still talks to me even though I killed him once. <laughs> but more important than that, that day he may have ended up as a statistic, a number on a piece of paper, nothing more. But what I want you to get is he was a man with three children. Heart attack destroys families. It takes away loved ones. It devastates communities and we can prevent it. It is time for us to stop crystal balling. It is time for us to look to a better idea in the future. We can be more precise about cardiovascular risk. We can identify people. We can find people's real risk of heart attack, find those at high risk and make a difference. My hope today is to educate, inform, and hopefully even empower the people here so that you ask the right questions, so you get the best healthcare, so you don't die from a heart attack. If you've got someone you know or love and you think this information is valuable for them, share it, please. If by chance you see this on a video, I would flatter myself if you did, please share it. This is so important because we can prevent heart attack, and we should. I appreciate your attention. I genuinely wish you all good health, and please don't die from a heart attack.